you can't coach two players the same way and you can't coach exactly. through my eyes. You have to coach through the, their exactly. eyes. Do you think because you didn't have, in your own words, like that clean of a game yeah. that you had to really analyze what were the weaknesses of your opponents, where you could take advantages on the timing and that helped you on your coaching career afterwards? Or 100%, no question about it. And I think that because the game doesn't come easy to players like myself, and I think also for Brad, Brad Gilbert is a good friend of mine, very similar for him as well and he wrote this book called winning ugly yeah. and that kind of is well. yeah that's what makes a good coach is that it doesn't come easy you don't have these big weapons you can't get through the best players in the world very easily so you've got to find ways to get into the matches and find weaknesses in in opponents and that's gone on a little bit from there now because okay. we get a lot of help these days with the analytics training techniques uh, dietitians the way players prepare for matches so it's gone from sort of being a player and a coach together to now having a big team around us and all working together. But you need that analytical mind, I believe, to be a pretty good coach on tour. So if I understand this correctly, the game has gotten so complex now yeah. that you need definitely a team around to really hit the top, let's say top 50 in the world. Yep. And how is that team communicating and working together? I'm guessing the player is obviously the main person. Yep but you are the one directing everything behind it. True, the player is certainly the CEO of the company and the main person, yes. and with that, everything flows down from there. I think the coach takes the most responsibility because that's what we're there for. That's why the players get up every morning and train. They, they want to win okay. and they want to find ways to win. And ultimately we can preach about, go out there, do the best you can. We don't care about the winning or losing. Just give us your best effort. Okay, that's really good. Everybody, Everybody wants to win. win. Everybody yeah. wants to win. So you're trying to help the players find ways to win matches and especially the big ones. And there's a great saying, especially with the players that I've coached, there's a great saying in Grand Slams is that you don't win a Grand Slam in the first week, you only lose it. Those great coaching days are the ones where your player doesn't play their best tennis, but they problem solve really well and they yes. find ways to get through those difficult matches. That's where you get a lot of satisfaction from a coach's point of view because you know you get to come back the next day and survive and fight again. That's amazing. Now, you have worked also with top male players yeah. and female players. Is, is there an, a different approach to it? Is there anything, insights that you, you could share with us on, on how to work with in, in the men's and the, in the women's game? To be true, I don't think there's a great deal of difference. Okay. The court is the same. The techniques have to be very similar in the way they go about there and the training very similar. The only thing I would say is a little bit different is the emotional side comes into it a bit more in the WTA than it does in the ATP and that is simply because unless you're Serena who's got the greatest serve the women's game has ever seen, yeah. the women don't have that big weapon to finish points on okay. their own terms. So in the men's game you can get up a set and a break and you can cruise to the finish line by bombing the serve, winning your service games pretty easily, Holding. and create chances in that second set where you can relax. In the women's game, that doesn't happen so easily. So you get to a set and a break up by implementing great strategy, playing correct tennis. Once you get that set and a break up, if you change that, if you look to finish points a little bit quicker, if you go for more, if you change anything about the strategy, which is which you can do, yeah. things can change pretty quickly in a quickly in a WTA match. So I would say that the mental part of the game comes into it a bit more on the WTA side. And that's why I think a lot of the female players are so mentally strong and don't get credit where credit is deserved because okay. they have to fight and claw their way to the finish line every single match, where that getting to the finish line comes a bit easier in the men's game. That's a, that's a very interesting insight yeah. because as a fan, I'm watching and I'm completely missing this part of the game. You're seeing the collapses a little more, right? Yes. Yeah, a player gets up and they're leading 5-1 in exactly. the set. And you're seeing a player get nervous, um, changing their strokes, get a little bit emotional because they can't get over the finish. Mm -hmm. That's where all that work, the, all the work you do on the practice court, all the work you do with your player 24-7, um, going to dinners, talking about tennis, talking about what you're thinking about. The, the biggest part about coaching is asking questions, doing exactly what you're doing now. Because if we don't ask questions of our players, we never really get to know how they tick and how they think. And I have this one thing that I, I talk about when I talk to a bunch of kids is that you can't coach two players the same way and you can't coach yeah, exactly. through my eyes, you have to coach through their exactly. eyes. And if I was to give you, if you say to me, I'm gonna hit you a short ball on my forehand on the service line, 
I'm going to take that forehand inside out and come to the net and say, pass me if you can. I'm good enough to knock that volley off. But I'm coming in 10 times out of 10. And if I hit a good approach shot, I'm probably winning that point 7 out of 10 times. You might pass me a couple of times. Maybe I miss a volley. Maybe I don't because I haven't missed a volley in 30 years. <laughs> but maybe I win that point 7 out of 10 times. If I give that to Leighton Hewitt, he's going to hit that a little left to right. He's so fast, he's going to wait to see whether or not his opponent puts two hands on the racket or one hand on the racket. He's going to hold his speed. Okay. If they have two hands on the racket, he's going to go back to the baseline. If they have one hand on the racket, he might come forward and hit a swing volley winner, but he's so fast, he doesn't have to commit to coming in. If I give that same shot to Andre, Andre Agassi, he's going to go, yeah, I could hit this for a winner, but I'm going to hit this ball over here just so you can run it down. One more time. And then I'm going to hit it over here, and then I'm going to hit it over here, and then I'm going to burn your legs and I'm going to make you run five corners. So not only am I going to win this point, I'm going to win the next, the next four. four. And I'm going to stand up on that service line within five seconds and serve the next ball. And if I give that same ball to Simona, she's going to go, my God, I've got to hit a winner on this shot because I don't want to come to the net. I don't want to be anywhere near the net. So the one shot in tennis, and you know how complicated tennis is? Absolutely. That's yeah. one shot in tennis exactly. that four players see that one shot completely differently. So unless you ask questions of your player and learn how they think in those big moments, you'll never really coach effectively. Now, well, obviously you have been on the tour for a very long time and yeah. you have won the trust and your know-how speaks for itself. But still you have to bring your points across. And these guys are professional players yeah. who know what they are doing as well. How is that back and forth, that feedback, is this like, I'm telling you what to do? Is it more, did we discuss about this? How, how is that communication process? Going? So it's more a conversation. And if I truly believe there's an area of a player's game that I feel like I can improve yeah. and I'm struggling to get the message across, you have to be adaptive and you have to find other ways to get that message across. Honestly, most of the time it's through video. Okay. So I was a player that didn't feel it very easily but I saw it really well. So if you said to me, Darren, you're a little bit open on that forehand side, I need you to close your stance a little bit, there's a good chance you, I wouldn't naturally wouldn't close my stance. Okay. But if you show me a video of me being too open, I went, oh my God, how ugly is that? Okay. <laughs> I gotta close got that you stance. Yes. Then I would close the stance. So I think a lot of tennis players are like that. And that's where the analytics and the video technology and everything that we have with us today helps us be better coaches because there's not just one way you can coach. There are many different ways you can coach. And this is something that I have also um, sparked my curiosity. I've seen uh, your videos on, on, on social media. Yeah. You're actually very, very tech affine. I have the feeling you, you're always using cameras, analytics. Yeah. How, how do, you, do you implement this in your uh, coach? I think it's really just ticking the boxes because we have doesn't matter if you're coaching a junior at a local club or you're coaching a pro chasing their dreams on the pro tour. Eh? You have your, their dreams in your hands and you're trying to make them as good as you possibly can be. So I think it's great responsibility when somebody taps you on the shoulder and say, hey, can you coach me? You have the responsibility to do, do the, the best job you can possibly do. So you don't have to implement all those measures. You don't have to bring out the video every single day, but you do have to care. Okay. And caring about the player that you're coaching, I think, is the most important thing. And honestly, the best relationships I see on tour uh, with the player and the coaches where they do care about each other. And the coach really does care about the player and the success they're trying to have on tour. And, and that comes across. And the way you translate all the statistics, numbers, or whatever yeah. you're seeing, again, we see a lot of stats. What yeah. do they mean? How do you bring that across in, in simple ways for the player? Like, I'm, I'm trying to understand that yeah. relationship that you have with them, that you build with them. So the analytics and the stats do mean a lot. They give us a lot of help, but maybe only about 5% okay. of what coaching really is. And what the stats don't show you quite often is whether or not your player is zigzagging inside and outside the baseline mm -hmm. and catching that ball on the rise. Okay. Uh, how fast that ball is coming, is it coming with top spin? is it coming with slice, uh, is that racket getting back far enough or does it need to be shortened on that return of serve, are you taking too big, there's 15 to 20 different things that you're looking for as a coach that you can only pick up watching the video or watching a match live, not off the stats or the analytics. So the analytics will give you a little bit of a step up. Okay. But the good coaching comes from doing the grunt work, the old school coaching, going back to the video, going and scouting matches, 
doing the stuff that everyone's been doing for 100 years. If you're not prepared to do that, if you want to coach off the, analy the analytics, analytics and the stats, alone. you're not going to be yeah, a very successful exactly. coach. There are a lot of coaches watching us. Uh, they are very curious about this. You mentioned that when you are coaching someone, when you're working with someone, you're fully committed to it, yep. 100%. And you're working a lot on the fundamentals of the mm -hmm. game. What do you mean by that? The best players or athletes in any sport are brilliant at the basics. Okay. So a lot of the questions I get when I go and, and talk to a bunch of kids or a bunch of coaches is they want the magic pill. They want the special drills that all the best players in the world are doing. The, the ones that are going to transform their kids. Exactly. Instantly, <laughs> without all the hard work. <laughs> They're not there. You know, there are drills that you can make complicated and certainly drills that we can do that to, to make it complicated. But all the best players in the world are brilliant at the basics. And they're brilliant at the basics because they spend more time on them than anybody else. So that's working footwork, working technique, making sure that everything is in the right position to effectively get the best timing, the best spin, the best accuracy of their shot. And they do it over and over and over again. And I know tennis is not like golf, but we try to make it like golf because golf, you're in the one position. Different lies, yeah. of course, but you're in the one position executing the one type of swing most times. That's what we're trying to do with tennis. And the reason we do that with tennis is with great footwork. So if you can get your feet into the right position when the ball's coming, yep. you are basically just replicating the same shot. So that's what we're working over and over and over again. So that's why... Machines like the slinger bag come in really handy is because it gives you that ability to work on technique and have your coach right next to you talk to you about it. It's just, I guess it makes it much easier for you to keep the eye on what's important, which is the player, yeah. and not feeding or doing other stuff like that. Right? Yeah, and it's really important also, for me anyway, is that you don't just go onto the court 